My Zoom may be going in and out. I don't know. I just got kicked off for a little bit and I'm here to see any of you. Okay, well, um, I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of April 6, 2021 to order. It's a couple minutes after 2 p.m. And uh, we're here mostly to continue the budget review of the um, Pel Amherst Pelham Regional S School District FY22 budget. Um, but before we do that, I need to go through some um, formalities. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law 38, Section 18, this meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted by a remote participation. Um, and uh, I'm going to um, ask each member of the committee to indicate their presence and uh, that uh, that will confirm that they've been able to hear me and we'll know that we've heard them. So um, I'll start with uh, Kathy Shane. Yes, here. Yes. Bob Hagner. Here. <clears throat> Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Uh, Pat D'Angelis. Present. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Present. And Jane Scheffler. Present. Okay, so I think that everybody's here. And I also want to um, thank uh, Superintendent uh, Morris and uh, Finance Director Slaughter from the um, Regional Schools for being with us yet again. And we have um, from our finance staff, Sean Mangano and Sonia Aldrich um, are also present. Um, the purpose of today's meeting, because everybody from the Finance Committee and the Council was present um, for last night's presentation, so we are going to um, focus today on asking questions about the budget um, that was presented and about other concerns regarding the finances of the schools. And um, so I will be recognizing people and, rec and then funding out and also recognizing other counselors um, and um, I know that uh, Mandy Haneke uh, has um, some questions that she would like to bring, uh, ask and I will bring her in. For um, anybody who's watching from the public, I need to just um, explain that this has not been posted as a council meeting and um, we can only bring one counselor in at a time because otherwise we, we would have a quorum of the council present at the meeting and it has not been posted. We have to um, uh, be very measured and uh, bring counselors in as attendees um, as appropriate. Um, I'm going to start uh, see if there are anybody from the um, committee that would like to um, start off and ask first questions or whether they would because um, I also I have some things that I have been thinking about that I want to turn to others first. Kathy? Yeah, I had, I had a few questions. Um, one is um, I, I actually didn't scroll through all the line by line detail but it, is there a place there or is there a place on the website where I can see uh, the student population middle and high school and the FTEs middle and high school, both, you know, you're projected for next year and any kind of trend line. So I, it's a question just on a where, if I wanted to see that information, that was a general question. Um, and then I'll do the... And the reason I'm asking is like, I, I did a couple percent changes. So the salary line goes up by about, 
the total salary line on one of them goes up by about 4%. So I was looking for what's underneath that. Is that with a steady number of people? Is there an increase, a decrease? You know, just something so I can do a context for it. Um, so that's a question there. And then my other question, and I'll turn this over to anyone else, um, is the reserves, um, you explained them last night, you know, the contingency and reserve line, it goes up by, it's projected to go up by about 50% from the year before. So what I want to know is, is that the total amount you have? Or is there another account, like you have some from last year? Is that something you have to use each year? Can you accumulate it if you uh, if you don't need to draw on it? Can it be available for next year? So just understanding how that uh, reserve works. Um, if I may, I'll, I'll answer the second question first, I think. Um, so regarding the reserves, so in, in the regional schools, we have E&D, which is excess and deficiency. There are some limits on that. Um, as a general rule of thumb, we try to try to keep at least 3% uh, of our operating budget in reserves. Uh, there is a state limitation on us to only hold no more than 5%. If we get above that 5%, we're required to essentially pay the towns back um, because they don't want us to sort of stack up a bunch of reserves and continue to assess the towns when we could be funding our operation with, with those monies. So they, they put a pretty tight limit on us um, in that regard. Um, and so we, you know, we're trying to sort of nuance that three to five percent each year, um, and we can. So once our E and D is certified, which happens, um, you know, you sort of finish the fiscal year, you go through an end of year process. At that point in time, they certify your E and D for that year. You can then appropriate from that money at that time, uh, and you have to put it into. If you're going to use it in a subsequent fiscal year, you have to appropriate it essentially before June 30th of that year, because as soon as June 30th hits. That certification expires, and so the amount of ED essentially disappears. It's uh, you know the free cash in 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 a town's budget operates the same way. Um, if it's certified, you know, and during the time that it's certified, then you're it, it's eligible to be spent. Um, we typically hold about two hundred eighty thousand dollars year over year as a contingency uh, block of money. We try not to spend that unless absolutely necessary, and then we will often use an additional piece of that ED to help support our budget. This year, as we were going through the E&D process, we were concerned uh, because we have, a, you know, we had uh, several things we were waiting to sort of see. Um, we thought our E&D number would be would be lower, and it is uh, decidedly lower than it has been in recent years. Um, and so, we went a little more conservative with the amount of you know E&D usage for this uh, to support the coming budget, which is why it's only two hundred thousand um, dollars. Our certified. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt you, Doug. We lost. It looks like we lost Andy. Can you hang on for just a moment, and we'll see if we sure. can try and get him back. So who wanted Baylor to win last night? I had a I had a back to Zags because it's a Catholic school and even though it's a Jesuit school, I was educated by the Franciscans. I still had to go with the Jags. I was I was rooting for Gonzaga too. Yeah, it was a disappointment. They're kind of like I mean they're in they're in the same company as the Patriots now. They've had a you know undefeated season and then lost it in the last game. <laughs> You're trying to goad me into this conversation as a Giants fan, Sean, because I really I'm trying to get a budget passed here. I don't want to alienate any people on this call. I feel like, I feel like you're tempting fate for me a little bit, Sean. It's OK. It's all right. You're, all, you're among friends. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Andy's trying to reconnect the net now.
Doug, who are you guys playing this weekend? Uh, we are playing Long Meadow on Saturday, actually, of this week. So, is that um in here or there? Uh, well, everything's away in some respects. Right. I, can't, I, I don't recall whether we're going to South Hadley, which we're playing our quote unquote home games, or uh, whether we're going to Long Meadow. I think we're going to Long Meadow. Okay. Or technically, I think East Long Meadow because Long Meadow is not on turf yet. They're playing a turf field. That's a tough matchup. Are they in the same division as as you guys? I believe so. They may be. They may be a little bigger than us these days. Okay. I'm not sure. I haven't checked recently. Okay. All right, folks. Think, I'm sorry. Thanks for waiting. Um, Andy's going to try and reboot his um, his internet, and if that doesn't work, then he's going to connect by phone. So he's asking if Kathy can take over until he gets reconnected. Okay, so Kathy is taking over, and <laughs> I, I will stop. Those are my two questions for now, and I will pull this up so I can see hands when they go up. So um, let me lower my own hand. Okay. So I Doug, just had a, a couple things on the FTE that I wanted to share with you. Um, you know, the FTE uh, is in that line by line. It does have it by department. I don't think it's got it totaled, uh, but we can certainly put that together for you as far as um, – sort of showing the overall FTE, um, you know, if you wanted to sort of go through and mark it up and <laughs> do it, you could do it that way. But uh, I don't have it at present uh, uh, a composite of the full FTE, um, you know, by year. It, it's, it's more segmented than that at this point. Well, be, I think it would be useful in, you know, either total, total or middle school and then high school. Um, and same with student population. I'm just trying to get a sense, you know, you in the PowerPoint chart, you showed some fall off on student population. So I'm just, that that provides me an overall context on what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the budget. Um, sure, sure. And if I could jump in, I think the one thing that's a real challenge for us as well as every other school, probably beyond you know, Massachusetts is that we anticipate our enrollment to go up significantly next year from the drop we had this year. Uh, we're already seeing that, frankly. It won't help us with our Chapter 70 funding, but because that's all based on October 1 counts. But um, as we've had an in-person return, even this week with the younger kids, and that'll move up by the end of the month to the older students, we're seeing a lot of students who are at private school or particularly were homeschooled uh, returning to us. Um, and those who aren't are saying, we'll be back in the fall. So I, I just want to caution in sure. this particular year budget, and not so much for you, Kathy, we've had that conversation, you know, in different contexts and a different committee. But um, I think for the um, for the general public who's watching that this is, uh, our enrollments this year are likely to be uh, unusually low compared to our enrollments next year. In general, we've been sort of plateauing on a slow decline, like every other, many other districts in Western Mass. But um, particularly as we go into next year with the state making, uh, adding barriers, frankly, to continuing any sort of virtual learning, uh, we do we do imagine that um, that clarity for families that we will be back five days a week in person next fall uh, will yield a higher enrollment than what we currently are experiencing. And do you ever? Um, and I do see many other hands, so I'll stop asking. But um, do you ever do a forecast the way you've said that you think it'll be back up by two percent, three percent, or you is it just a wait and see? Most years we do that. I think this year it's very, very difficult. Uh, we're trying to get people to commit at the middle school, high school to what they're doing three weeks from now. Uh, today's like the last day of responses. So to, to, to assume, I mean, that I'm, I'm not sort of a joke, but not really. Literally, the surveys are due today for middle school and high school folks. They were doing, we did a little extension, did outreach. So I, I think it's really hard to predict exactly how that'll play out. But I think particularly since we're talking about the regional budget, um, with Pfizer's good news last week, the fact that many, if not all of our students uh, at the regional level who want to be vaccinated will be able to be vaccinated likely by fall from what Dr. Fauci has said as recently as last week. I think that'll also offer assurance for families who are still on the fence of whether they want to return or not from a healthy safety perspective um, to be able to do that. I know we've, we've talked primarily about vaccinating uh, vaccinations for staff uh, and that conversation, I think, as we overhead over the next four or five months will very quickly shift. Um, many of our students became eligible. We sent an email just to help them uh, our 16 year old plus 16 and up students who have one medical condition became eligible Monday. We're trying to assist them as much as possible in, in being able to access vaccines. So uh, I think at the secondary level, it's a little cleaner. And since that's the only budget we're talking about at this meeting, I will cut myself off there. Okay, so I see. Um, and since I'm looking at this only now for the hands up, I see Bernie, then Dorothy, then Jane, then Lynn. So those are the hands I see up right now. So Bernie. 
And thanks, Kathy. Yeah, yeah, actually, Kathy anticipated the question I had about the E and D money. So, thank you for that response, Doug. Um, my concern about you, you guys, you, you you met your budget targets. I'm not going to go through line by line by line and say why this, why that. Um, but my concern is is how much of this 1.2 million dollar reduction um, is from one off kind of events versus um, an actual reduction in staffing equipment, some more heavy, more tangible, uh, repeatable kind of situation. Um, I, I noticed going through uh, about 29% of the reduction came from the tuition non public line in, uh, in, in special ed expenses. And um, I mean, we don't know if that's going to repeat. Um, you know, you might find it even more next year, uh, especially given the, the fact that you've got to front everything. Everything's got to be up front before the circuit breakers kick in. So, um, you know, how much of this is one off and how much of this is, is uh, um, an actual reduction? That's one question. Uh, and then the other question I have that's sort of that's COVID related is regarding retirements and what kind of retirements and impacts are you seeing on your staff and faculty? And um, uh, as those folks maybe shift from uh, shift to a retirement, um, is there potential savings there from bringing in new people? Um, I, I know that this might be tough to predict because there's some rumbling out there about a lot of a lot of concern about teachers maybe leaving mid-year next year. Um, so those are my those are my two questions. Sure. So a couple of things. So on the sort of, um, you know, as we uh, discussed a little bit last night, but, but certainly one of the difficulties in, in sort of laying out our, our reductions is that some are, are more temporary in nature and some are more permanent in nature or more direct services to students. Um, if we look at those that are, are, you know, things like turnover savings, you know, we do predict a little bit of what, what we think we'll see in that where, where staff are going to retire or leave and, and who we hire might be a little less expensive. Um, you know, those things, the health insurance premium holiday, et cetera, is about 38% of the total. Uh, you know, it's about $460,000 of those sort of one-time, uh, you know, savings that, that will may or may not reappear next year. Um, I think the other, you know, to your other point, you know, in, in special education in particular, often there's a lot of volatility to what our uh, demand is there as far as, you know, resources, depends on who the kids are, what their needs are. Um, so that always creates a bit of a, uh, a struggle for us there. Um, the last couple of years at the regional schools, that that level of need has been a little bit less. Um, so that has eased uh, the that section of the budget a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it, it depends on who moves into town and what those kids' needs are, what manifests itself during the course of the next year, um, as to what and how those will change. It's a little hard to predict in that in that regard. But um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I think um, you know the 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 lion's share or, you know, 60 plus percent, uh, almost 70% of, of, um, uh, of the reductions we're making this year are actual things that, that impact, uh, you know, our, our programs and, and uh, the number of folks that do the work that we do. Uh, some of that's resultant because of fewer kids being uh, in the building, even if we have an uptick relative to this year, um, you know, we're likely to be steady or a little below our, our overall population uh, uh, from previous years. So we've, we've seen a general decline in our enrollment over time. And, and at, at points in time, you know, we, will, we can make uh, reductions relative to that enrollment level, um, but they don't come as, as they, those kinds of transitions tend to be stepwise. They don't tend to be as, as smooth as uh, the uh, reduction in students. So those those kind of corrections to uh, staffing size relative to the number of students tend to be in, in a stepwise fashion over multiple years. Yeah, as, as to use the governor's phrase, it's, uh, it's lumpy and bumpy, I know that. And I've also done enough budgets that there hasn't been, I can tell you there hasn't been one single budget I haven't done when I haven't done some, what we used to call slipping and sliding, uh, cost shifting, um, sometimes just a lucky break made you look like a hero. So that wasn't a criticism, that was a concern about uh, being able to sustain the school at a, a, a reasonable level 
and when there's going to be considerable downward pressure on on, on the budget because of declining enrollments. And um, so thank you for that. I, I see, Andy, you're back. Um, so the the group that's queued up is Dorothy, then Jane, and then Lynn. Okay, well, just uh, we'll go to Dorothy then. Thank you. I'm sorry, the internet failure here, but hopefully I'm back for good. Dorothy? Okay, I have a couple of, of questions. Um, and um, one of them is about the um, reserves, the D&E. &D &E. And I'm not sure if I understood you. Um, I know that in some budgeting, you don't spend some of the year, the money years. But is that what you said? Is That's kind of what I heard, but I wasn't sure. That if you have the end of the year, spend it, roll it over, it becomes zero. Is that right? It it doesn't become zero. Um, what happens to it is it 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 uh, when it is certified, it's available to be utilized by the district um, in the in the time from the end of the fiscal year until we certify that number. Um, you know, whatever we have sort of in our savings account is is unavailable for use. Is is the way to say it. So it doesn't necessarily disappear. Um, but it is impacted by whatever uh, uh, spending we may have done from it in the previous year, but also um, whether or not there are any new, uh, you know, if we come in under budget, uh, you know, that potentially will boost our E&D or boost our savings in the same way in, in which that happens mm -hmm. with the town. Um, so it, it does work in, in the same way that, that uh, free cash does. It isn't that we don't have it on hand, it's literally in the bank for us. Uh, but the mm -hmm. ability to spend it is limited until it is certified, okay. and then it requires action oh. for the four communities to so do So the that. certification expires at the end of the year. Model there, you just can't use it. Right. Um, then I had a question about the premium holiday. Um, and the word holiday is a nice word, um, but it also has a bad meaning. I just wanted to make sure they said you don't owe anything this year, or you said we can't pay it this year. Which was it? I think Mr. Mangano may be able to better answer that question, but but uh, the short story is, um, you know, the, the, there's a sort of two factors when we do our our health insurance uh, renewal for the year. There's a there is what are they charging our members and our and the the district uh, for the health insurance, and they set that you know uh, rate uh, each year, and so this year it's going up 1.1 percent. Sort of separate from that, if their trust fund, in other words, their pool of money that they have where they've collected premiums over a number of years from all of the different clients, uh, starts to get to a level that's, that's fairly high. In other words, if they're carrying more cash on hand and uh, than they're comfortable with relative to how they you know, uh, are anticipating um, uh, usage of that for, for paying out uh, claims against their, the health insurance uh, fund that they have, um, they will periodically, uh, you know, essentially do a give back. And what they do is they don't charge us uh, the, uh, the premium for the month. And so we save as a district, but also all the employees save as well. Um, and that happens periodically over the years. They're currently just the number of claims over the last year has been really low. So their overall cash picture is high and, and they keep that separate from, from when, how they set their rates. But, but nonetheless, they tend to do it in a single uh, sort of months period of time when they do uh, it. Doug, uh, just, let me like get a clarification on exactly what you're talking about. Are you, is the region uh, still going, working with the town or are you independently um, insured now? No, we're with the town. So um, they're part of the, the same Maya program that we're, we're involved with, Dorothy. Okay. So I just want to make sure that it, they didn't owe it down the line. And then, then alas, is a whimsical question. Um, when you were talking about games, can you use COVID money to fix the athletic fields because it's outdoors, it's socially distanced, it's safe? Uh, we could make a good case for it. Um, has anyone tried it? I don't know if anybody's tried it. I think that there are there are potentially, I mean, I think there are probably some, some use of of COVID money that could be applied, probably not in any significant way. I think it would have to be very much directed toward the use for setting up outdoor classrooms or something of that sort. Um, I think the actual sort of 
you know, fields itself or that sort of, um, you know, uh, more fundamental fixing of the field is, is less likely to be eligible for that. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jane. Uh, yeah, apologies ahead of time. I have two very crabby six month olds around here. So if they're screaming children, I apologize. Um, so the question I had, and maybe this is a little too nitty gritty, but I noticed that there's an increase in payroll expenses under special education, but the of about 234,000. Um, but then the expense account decreased 132,000. And to me, that seems sort of counterintuitive if you're increasing staffing, wouldn't you have additional expenses? So I guess I'm just wondering about that. So I would say that that <clears throat> as far as the staffing is concerned, most of you know the additional besides their payroll, their actual costs for things like insurance, that sort of thing aren't going to be into the uh, special education expense line. It's going to be down in the risk and benefits uh, section. So that's one piece. The other thing is when we have more staff in special education, um, or, or we are able to carry more staff and cover more of the needs of the kids ourselves and we use less uh, contracted services. In other words, we use fewer providers outside the district to provide those services. Um, and sometimes it's just in the nature of who our kids are. So sometimes we have kids uh, you know, that have <clears throat> uh, expensive needs and they graduate. And so sometimes that reduction in expenses is, is, is related to kids that we know are exiting our system, with, whether they're turning 22 or whether they're uh, graduating and leaving the high school. So sometimes it, it, it's a bit disconnected and those two, they don't tend to track together. Jane, do you have anything else or shall I ask? That's all I have. Lynn? Lynn? You're muted, Lynn. <clears throat> Maybe how tired I am, I should stay that way. Um, I want to go back to um, the uh, Chapter 70 money, which is set on the October enrollment figures, and wonder if based on the uh, really unusual nature of this year, there has been any discussion about a re-examination of that and some kind of supplemental in the fall. I can jump in on that one. Um, my professional organization has been advocating to use the fall 20, excuse me, the fall 2019 enrollment numbers as proxy, given that the fall 2020 numbers we've seen um, such a different number uh, across the state. It's not like a local Amherst specific issue um, that has not gathered a tremendous amount of traction. Um, but um, I, you know, we have communicated that with our state reps, uh, state senator, um, and I think uh, it, it would certainly help, particularly at the regional level. Uh, it, it would help things, and it does feel particularly. So I'll leave some of my political commentary aside, but I support my professional organization's advocacy uh, to use a more reality-based measure and metric to uh, assess districts. There are districts just bluntly, and this maybe gets a little political, but I'll just say that are in much worse shape than us, that are more dependent on chapter 70 than the Amherst Com Regional School. So I know I'm talking about this district, but from an equity perspective and the social justice perspective, uh, when you look at some of the urbans and their percent loss, uh, it's much greater than ours, and they're more dependent on Chapter 70. So the, the response has been, well, you know, we have all this stimulus aid coming in, and so it all sort of offsets. But the stimulus aid, you know, and I appreciate the question earlier, I mean, we have pretty defined, you know, buckets where we're going to put that stimulus money that we got, you know, and I've spoken about this at school committee before. It's really about health and safety, uh, well-being and mental health, curriculum work, and some summer programming uh, that we're working on, um, not necessarily to backfill because um, I think it goes back to the earlier conversation of one-time money that Bernie and others raised, that if you're going to use that for your operating budget, not to kind of deal with the pandemic and the results and the impacts of the pandemic, you're just going to end up continuing on an unbalanced pathway. And that's what we're trying to avoid doing. So um, certainly, uh, I think the question you have or suggestion spot on, it's something I'm very supportive of, as is my professional organization. We've yet to get um, folks in Boston to perhaps see the wisdom of that. To date. I just want to urge that you talk about it with Paul and that we as counselors do what we can 
uh, to back that suggestion because it would be a much, much better number for Amherst to go with that number. Uh, so and I was the one last night that asked, to, asked you to talk today some about the CARES money, what you've been able to spend it on um, and what you haven't been able to spend it on and then how you see the new three-year funds that are coming down the pike. Sure, so I can speak to that. Uh, so in general, there's been sort of four buckets that we've used for the ESSER money uh, that we've received so far. Uh, some is for uh, little construction projects, as you know, at Fort Bourbon at Wildwood. Uh, there are no quads, there are halvesies. Anyone has a better name? We've been looking all year. No one comes up with a better name than halvesies, so any suggestions are welcome. Um, <laughs> but essentially, the rooms that used to be in four that didn't uh, that shared ventilation systems are now uh, split into two. Uh, and, and there are different projects in the Fort River Wildwood because of the different needs of the buildings. They're they're you know architecturally pretty identical, but then some of the elements in the in the buildings actually are not. Um, but that was a pretty healthy amount of funds, but it's meant that kids are in school right now in a way that we feel like is much safer and much better for students. Um, they're beautiful rooms now, actually. They're, they're very large and they're able to accommodate. It creates a space crunch and will continue to, particularly as we head to next year where we lost uh, a significant number of classrooms. Uh, so it, it's not a perfect fix. It's not a long-term fix, but when it comes to health and safety and ventilation, we were going to put our money where our mouth was and make sure we're doing everything we could to keep students and staff safe. Uh, the second area was around PPE. We've bought um, lots and lots of PPE, K95 masks for our staff, masks for students, sanitizer. We've, been, we've installed sanitizer stations throughout our schools, electrostatic sprayers, um, a whole host of, of cleaning and uh, personal protective equipment for students and staff. And so that was a second significant expense. Uh, the third one was we did need some additional staffing. So for instance, all of our schools have certified nurses assistants that was not but unbudgeted uh, so that if there is a student who becomes ill with COVID-like symptoms, they're moved to an isolation room uh, outside the nurse's office, um, have the option of doing testing, uh, by next testing uh, right on site. And so there are other areas, um, like especially in, especially in special education, we did have to look at some contracted staff um, so the third bucket that we've spent it on is staffing. And the last one is around technology and technology products. So since we, we knew we were going to spend at least some of the year, in some cases for some of our students, all of the year remote because they're opting to, uh, we need to enhance our systems, um, our training and our technology to make virtual education much more robust than we were able to last year when we didn't have the additional products uh, at our disposal. Um, we've also increased the Wi-Fi networks in our schools. Um, mostly doubled the, come close to doubling the speed uh, over the last couple of months so that as we were turning in person for students who were remaining remote, especially at the high school, they were able to sort of uh, dial into class. Uh, that's not our model at the other levels, but at the high school it is. Uh, and, and we could handle the bandwidth um, that was going on. So that's what we've spent it on. You know, what we're planning to spend it on again, we'll continue to have health and safety um, challenges. We still have rooms we're not using because the ventilation isn't up to ASHRAE standards. Uh, so we'll have and a lot of these are larger spaces that are going to be more challenging uh, to improve the ventilation in. all our classroom spaces are in good shape. Um, so that'll be an additional expense. We probably we may need to continue with a certified nurse assistant and some of those models. We don't know that yet, but we at least think that that may be something we have to do. We will need to restock our PPE. Uh, COVID, you know, if someone asks, is school going to be back to normal next year? And I said, here's what's hard. We got into this very abruptly. March 13th, I said, we're closing school. March 15th, the governor said, all schools must be closed. Uh, and that's been our experience. And that's gonna be the opposite of how we get out of this. It's gonna be very incremental. Things are gonna get better and better and better. I, I'm an optimist about that, but it's not gonna happen the same way we got into it. It's gonna happen at a pace that's probably inconsistent with people's hopes uh, and dreams of how we're gonna do it. So we are gonna need to still have PPE. We're still gonna need to uh, have lots of items uh, that we need to manage that way. Um, we are concerned about the mental health needs. If you've been reading any of the papers locally or, or nationally, you're aware of some of the mental health concerns that um, are being expressed. And we are looking to how do we bolster our staffing uh, in case management, because we know the number of students who are going to require some more intensive intervention is going to be greater. Um, Third is that we are gonna to have to adjust our curriculum. Um, our teachers have done a fabulous, and staff done a fabulous job this year. Uh, 
And we know that students are gonna return not quite in the same place as we might typically have expected them to return. So we are gonna to have to adjust our curriculum uh, as a result of that. And we are starting, though this is a little more elementary centric, we are still looking at our summer programming and seeing if we can add more robust summer programming um, to again, support students in their reacqu reacquisition of uh, in-person learning and the knowledge that comes from that. And so those are our, at this point, our, our thoughts. We have not received any formal guidance from Stessy. We've only received the guidance from, you know, um, Representative McGovern uh, and from the feds, but that all gets filtered through the state and we have not received, and Doug, I think, I think it's true. I think I can say we on this have not received any formal guidance on specific uses and, you know, even the amounts or estimates and um, Desi still is concerned that Title I schools have been left out of this altogether and they're talking about adjusting things. So uh, we don't have a final number, but in terms of our intention, that's uh, how we're intending to spend the funds. It's very directly pandemic related to speak to an earlier point. Uh, and it was this year, but I think some of the things we have done and some of the things we're gonna to need to continue to do. And, and I think the good thing is good ventilation is good for non-pandemic times as well. So we are trying to think about the long-term uh, particularly as it relates to our middle school and high school, which aren't going anywhere um, anytime soon, and making sure that the improvements we're making are something that is sustainable and that uh, will give peace of mind long after you know uh, COVID is as present in our lives as it is today. Okay. Uh, that was very, very helpful. And I was uh, very glad to hear you talk about the possibility of needing mental health uh, additional professionals or assistance, both with teachers and, and students. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the adjustments to the curriculum that you talked about? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of things. One is that at the high school, we are uh, for next year, again, due to COVID, we are moving to a block schedule, which is a, uh, this year we had an adjusted block, but this year is a very different um, kind of thing. So a block schedule means that Students, if you think of a, a typical college schedule, that's sort of what a block schedule is. So students will take four courses a term. Um, some of the courses like electives, actually there's more opportunities because a lot of those meet every other day. Um, so you're able to sort of group them together. Um, but it, what it means is that teachers are teaching 80, 90 minute courses instead of 50 or 60 minutes. So that courses are going to need to be adjusted. Uh, to be able to support students. Now, I say that's COVID related because that involves less mixing of students. Right? So our typical schedule would have students in the seven drop one, which seven periods, um, but one gets dropped on alternating basis every day. And when you think of contact tracing, that's about the worst uh, COVID environment one could suggest uh, from a contract tracing perspective. Um, but, you know, lots of Northampton, Cambridge, lots of school districts use a block schedule long before COVID uh, was around, but one of the things that we hear from every district is if you're gonna do it, you really gotta to have to adjust your curriculum to make it work. And then you have the additional variable of students coming back in a year where you know, we have some evidence that students didn't learn the same level of information um, that they would have in a typical school year. That's again, not a knock on our teachers at all. That's just the nature of some of the challenges inherent in distance learning it didn't work for every kid. For some students it's worked fabulously, but not, not for all. Um, so we want to adjust our curriculum that way, but we also want to be very thoughtful about uh, entry into courses, prerequisites, um, and knowing that students have, are going to need to, um, they not, may not necessarily be in the same place come the first day of school as we would expect in the past and adjust our curriculum to make sure that we're accommodating for that. To assume that everybody's right back to where we were, you know, is going to be a, a setup for students to get quite frustrated and not make the effective progress that we know they need to make in the next school year. Okay. I had one more question for the moment, Andy. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So last night you signaled out the math line item as it seemed like that was a place where you used to kind of balance a certain way. Could, could somebody give a better explanation now that we have just this group? Sure, I can. I can. The former can. math teacher. Right. So, and I think this is, is something we discussed a little bit at the, at the school committee meeting as well, is that, you know, we have traditionally in, in utilizing school choice money, um, uh, directly applied it to a particular area of, of the budget. In, our, in the case of the regional school district, we applied in the math uh, uh, teachers uh, uh, payroll line. Um, and we used, you know, essentially half of it at the middle school and half of it at the high school. 
Um, and that's what we traditionally done. And so when, when we made an adjustment, uh, you know, relative to some, some uh, potentially new uh, support for the district, then, then it sort of shifted a number that isn't one that typically shifts as we go late into the budget. So that's confusing. And I think, uh, I think for next year, just as a sort of prelude to, to coming attractions, um, I, I may represent that more directly. Uh, there are some other kinds of funds like our transportation reimbursement or our uh, Medicaid reimbursement where we, we call it out directly as a, as a source of revenue kind of on its own line, separate from where we ultimately may apply those funds. Um, and so I may do that for the coming year just to make that happen that way. But, but the short story is, is that one of the things, one of the rationales for, for using the mathematics uh, teachers is virtually every student takes a math class. And so when we're gonna apply school choice and, and sort of support our budget through school choice funds, we apply it to a department that virtually every student takes uh, a class in. And so that's, that's really why. Thank you. Okay. So let me tell you what I'm thinking about and uh, if there's, see if there's agreement from the committee. We have a couple of attendees, one who's a counselor uh, who I know has questions. The other attendee is uh, not a counselor, but um, I do. we do have a public comment period. And um, if she has a comment or a question, I would uh, uh, certainly feel important to recognize that as a part of our normal process. Um, and I don't know whether to do that now or whether uh, Dorothy and Kathy would like to ask their um, questions that they've had a second round questions first since your committee members. Uh, my inclination is to go ahead and have Dorothy speak, then Kathy, uh, and then uh, uh, get into the public comment that I just described. So if that's acceptable, then I will go ahead and uh, recognize Dorothy. Yes, I think my question may be one that someone may want to follow up on. Uh, I am interested in hearing about the possibility of a very, very robust summer program, which would have optional and some perhaps not optional aspects to it, because we have been, many things I'd suggest there's been great educational loss. We've also talked about the social and um, um, mental illness uh, aspects of, of the isolation that many students have endured. Um, I, I think that, I mean, any kind of program that everybody has to do for the summer would be great, whether it's purely uh, athletics or anything that involves playing, being together, socialization, doing work in groups. But I think we also know that a lot of students did lose base. And I'm just hoping that there's some way that there's a, a very robust summer program that's gonna happen. And I have no idea how that would be paid for, but I guess it should be paid for with you know, state and federal money. That's my comment. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll briefly respond that I think we all share the same concerns for students that you express. And um, as we still yet don't have guidance or a final number from the state government on the stimulus, um, at this point, we have limited funding for similar you know, summer programming that we've had in the past. Um, as we get more guidance, we may be able to put something together. And I think you know, some students will uh, flock to that. And for other students, um, they have other things that they have planned for the summer, whether that's work and, you know, we have a lot of our high school students that do are employed over the summer um, or other things. So I think when, I, when you, what I heard mandatory, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure how likely that is, but I think I agree with the larger principle of uh, understanding how we can use the stimulus call dollars that are coming our way to support students with robust summer programming. I think I'm, you know, we're on board with that. And once we get more information from DESE, we'll, uh, we'll be working on that as well. Did Kathy, did you have? Hey, yeah, I, I'll just, both of mine are um, more questions that I don't think you can answer right now, but uh, be thinking about it. One is related to the sixth grade moving up to the middle school. Um, you started to talk about that a little bit last night, but um, I have been thinking that if you had those kids um, that cohort of children in the school, 
uh, potentially programs like the language program, the music program, and some that are getting on the small side to support the extra services, those costs could be spread more generally. And so you get the an economist term, economy of scale, that you get more students. And that um, can you, um, at what point will you be able to start thinking about that um, in, and then making a plan for it and getting those classrooms ready because it might help the middle school for a budget cycle. So that's one, one question I had. And then Dorothy raised the summer program issue, but the discussion last night that started in a direction where you said that's not gonna be your decision on uh, the safety committee talking about potential reallocation of some of the money that's going for two police. Um, I don't know whether the schools will ever would will look at what's coming out of that committee as Paul is making decisions, but a potential short term allocation would be for a summer program for at risk kids, you know, to give them something to do. Um, so it might be a nice match for the at rich kids who weren't working. So just trying to think of where that kind of segue um, and whether that's short term, like just for one year or whether it could be thought of that way. So those are my two comments. Um, and I know the second one isn't answerable at this point because it's not in your hands. Yeah. Um, well, I can answer, I can I can make a comment, a brief comment on that one. So the, the on that one, we do have some very limited programs we have uh, utilized in the past summer. We do have some summer support roles um, usually in the technology and the uh, facilities field where we have been successful at identifying students who would benefit from that experience and it benefits the district. So um, I think we do have a, a template for what that might look like and expanding that I think would be, would be fabulous for our students as well as for the district. So um, I'm not gonna weigh in on the larger point that you raised, but in terms of what might we think about and might there be uh, summer activities and gainful employment that uh, benefits our students and their families financially, but also benefits a district, you know, we'd be very open to that discussion if that's how it, how it comes up. Uh, on your first piece on the sixth grade, um, we, uh, so are there economy scales to be realized? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that's just a, you know, I can do that in a binary way. Yes, there are. Um, I think we will, I know the school committees will start re-engaging this topic next month in the month of May. Um, so people should be on the lookout for um, kind of some of their thoughts and if they assume, if they decide to, you know, go forward with an engagement uh, on that, I know everyone will know about it and uh, we'll keep everyone in the council as well as the larger community informed of the progress on that front. Uh, we plan to do that this year and, you know, unfortunately uh, things got in the way, but it's not that, and not because of a lack of interest or lack of desire to explore that, that decision point much further before it gets made. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to pause for a second and uh, see um, if um, the attendee who's not a counselor is interested in being recognized, um, then I would, um, if she raised her hand, then I would know that. In the meantime, Athena, can you bring the counselor um, who's in the attendee list into the meeting? Um, thank you. So uh, Mandy Haneke is uh, now um, a part of the meeting is uh, a form of public comment and uh, the, the other attendee can raise her hand if she would like to be recognized. Um, I did have a little bit of a conversation with Mandy and I'm gonna start with an observation and then um, ask her to follow up with questions that she may have. Um, Doug and I um, were members of the old finance committee many years ago, and so we've been used to looking at school budgets for a while. And um, the school budgets have traditionally been presented in the, for the region in the way that they're presented now, where you would take what the budget, uh, what, what, what the program generally was for the year at hand, project to the next year, call that uh, level services, and then um, have additions and in adjustments from there. Um, what I've observed happening over time is that um, initially uh, there were increases. 
so it was working well and um, it, it just sort of seemed to something we were all used to so that um, that seemed to be the way that budgets were presented and that was fine what's happened over um, recent more recent years is that it always ends up appearing as cuts though the cuts have not always been um, in substantial cuts, some have, some have not, because we've also had declining enrollment during that period of time. But we've gotten into this thing every year where there it's always presented as, um, we're gonna have to cut this amount of money next year, and it's always presented as a crisis. And I think that that's beginning to take a key, an effect on the member towns. And um, I'm not sure that it's a helpful way of presenting the budget. And I felt that last night in particular because the size of the cut caused a public relations dynamic that then led into this other discussion that we all talked about, about what other cuts the town could make in order to supplement the budget. And I don't think that that um, really is a fair presentation of what the, what I see as the problem in the budget. And I want to, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but I wanted to start with that observation. And um, I, um, with that, Mandy, do you have anything that you'd like to take up now since you're now in part of the meeting? Yeah, thank you. Um, I can follow up with that one. And then the conversation beforehand actually brought forth a couple of other questions I have specific to the budget. Um, you know, and, and I'll just give some examples of what I'm experiencing and trying to read the budget as it's presented. Page two shows a budget. It shows a, um, a payroll account expense line and an expense account expense line, and then just lops off $1.2 million. And then the next 45 pages, um start with the give give me the numbers that add up to the budget line before the 1.2 million dollars is lopped off and then the last page page 48 is then where it says oh but here's where we're going to lop up off that money um the problem is when i try to do stuff some and some comparisons is for example on page 23 the high school para line shows 33.85 ftes for both fy 21 and 22 but page 48 shows a decrease of three FTEs in paras. Um, and the para line on page 23 shows an increase of 39,000 for paras. And I don't know whether that includes or excludes the salaries for the three that are being lopped off on page 48. Um, and so that's just one example of many on how this is presented that makes it really hard for me as a counselor to look at the budget, analyze it, really try and figure out what what is actually being cut, what is not, um, what is these one-time things that don't affect programming, but the next year in FY23, an increase might need to be substantial because we got a holiday the year before. Um, so it would be really helpful to me um, if in the future, we are not seeing a level services number, we are seeing an actual number in the line items that agrees with the number that I am asked to actually appropriate when the motion comes to the council, because the line item budget does not agree with that number. Um, and that that's problematic for me um, in terms of all of this. So to get to some of my specific questions, um, I appreciate that Councillor Griesemer asked about the math issue. And I have a follow up to that. Um, so it sounds like that 100,000 plus was added in into an expense line the math department expenses, yet it's actually an income line. And so you've now propped up the expense line to then cut the expense line. I'm trying to figure out, I mean, the way it was explained, Dr. Slaughter, was that, oh, this is choice in tuition that we're expensing to the math department. But it's tuition, which means it's a, is, doesn't that mean it's a, um, a revenue source? So why is it added into the expense department of the math line? That's, that's another one of these things where I, I'm just having a problem getting this because it seems like that would then prop up the expenses to then be able to, as, as um, Councillor Steinberg indicated, claim there's a lot of cuts to services. Um, and I, 
so, so that's one of my follow up questions. Um, I'm happy to pause there to get an answer to that before I go to some of my other follow up questions. Yeah, I'll talk about the first one and then Doug can jump in on the second one and perhaps Sean because I think Sean was there when we had to readjust where school choice started to put you on the spot Sean you can't get away from it but um, where school choice is represented was was changed because of a, you know, the legal advice we received. So on the first one on the line item piece, I mean, this is not gonna be, I'm, I'm doing a good job of disappointing counselors last night and today, so I apologize for that. But um, the reality is the school committee voted the budget last week. Um, so if there's gonna be a desire to have that all updated after, and we didn't know that the school committee is gonna approve any specific budget, right? We had public comments to the very end where school committee was reconsidering certain cuts. I mean, I would frankly recommend to the council that you might wanna push back the date by which you have hearings about the regional school budget. Uh, I think if we could push up the regional school budget, we would, but as we found out this year, even with the timeline we had, we continue to have changes. So uh, a piece of feedback for the council is, I, I think I totally acknowledge and understand the concerns that are being expressed here. Um, this timeline is way faster than most other towns. Like if you look at Northampton, other places, when they're having their discussions is quite a bit later. Uh, when numbers become more firm, I think the challenge you have is there's three other towns that are gonna have town meetings. And so I know, I understand why, but I wanna point out the problem isn't uh, that we're trying to disappoint the council um, or not give accurate information to the council. And the problem isn't that um, anyone's doing anything to try to confuse uh, the counselors, it's simply a timing challenge. And so maybe for a conversation offline uh, that you wanna have with a school committee chair or myself, uh, I think if there was more time between when the school committee actually votes a budget and we know what the budget actually gets passed and when the council's looking at it, that might be a better way. I know we talked about this with Doug, we talked about when Sean was here, that this is, this is a continual problem. Uh, now that there's a town council, I would hope that we might be able to adjust things uh, with timing that we weren't able to and in the past, and that hasn't really happened. Um, so um, I know there's an interest in getting it sort of out in front of town meetings of the other towns, but there's, there's a downside to that as well. Um, Doug or Sean, do you want to tackle the school choice math piece? Um, I'll, I'll start. Maybe Sean can, can chime in and, and, and get to that. So um, you, you're exactly right that, that uh, you know, school choice is a revenue source. And so when we apply it in an expense line, it, it's, it shrinks it. So when we use less school choice, we are subtracting a smaller number than we would. So, uh, you know, that means that the amount to be supported by the general fund would be, would go up um, and therefore be the, you know, or the general fund monies that, that would be assessed ultimately or be a part of the budget uh, supported by tax dollars from the four communities uh, is a larger number. Um, I don't disagree that, that it's not easy to sort of see it. And you know, I've been thinking about this even just while we've been talking here about how to represent that more clearly when we apply it uh, to a line like that, or, or like I said earlier, maybe even pulling it out completely from a, a particular line within the budget and, and have it show as a you know, revenue source uh, you know, on its own and then, and then uh, you know, indicate where it will be applied once we do put it into the budget. Um, and, and to the, that larger point, yeah, we, we, because the ads and cuts is a fluid thing until uh, the budget's finalized, we don't formally put it into the, the line by line until that happens. Um, you know, when we publish our final budget, we definitely sort of put those adjustments to any of those categories into their specific locations at that time, but you're, you're right that they don't. Um, the other thing I would say just around the FTE question is, you know, we had an, you know, as we were trying to refine those numbers, um, you know, we're, we're internally in my office having the, the conversation about what are we trying to represent here? What are we, uh, you know, trying to do? How are we representing this, you know, relative to what was budgeted, especially this year, because there was what was budgeted for FTE in a given department and what the needs have been and have arisen to be. And is that change in those types of things reflective of this year only and not really what we'd plan for for next year? And so we had this ongoing debate about how to represent some of those FTEs that made some sense. It's like, should we be reflective of what we originally budgeted, thinking we might be in person much more than we've been? Or should we reflect more of what is currently kind of happening, which is also, you know, changing on a daily basis, to be perfectly honest. And, and are we then also, when we're representing FTE for 22, are we representing um, 
relative to what we project we think we're going to need, which is generally the case. And so are we trying to base that off of what we thought we were going to do if we were going to be in person in 21? You know, so there's this give and take around those a little bit that we tried to be consistent with. Maybe we weren't perfectly, but, but trying to be consistent with as far as how we're representing the needs of a department, how we thought they would be and how they are in person this year or in, in school this year and then how we expect them to be for next year. It's, it's been a tricky task. It's always tricky, I think, in any given year, but particularly this year, um, you know, we've held positions open. We've leveraged people in other kinds of roles and they traditionally are in. Uh, that sort of thing. So it's been it's been a tricky uh, process to try to represent that well. Um, and I'm not saying we did, but we tried to. Uh, but I certainly you know understand the frustration and trying to interpret that a little bit and, and try to understand well what's going on in this group of of accounts versus that group of accounts. Thank you, Andy. Could I continue with some? Yes, of the go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have four main areas more of questions. Um, One's a follow-up to Councillor Griesemer's questions regarding the American Rescue Plan and, and anything that might be used to support the budget or hire additional um, staffing with those funds. And it goes back to, again, how the level services budget is presented um, or how your budget is presented in future years. It sounds like uh, some of those funds may be used to hire um, additional um, staff to support some needs of students. And I don't want you to think I'm against that um, my, because I think that's absolutely necessary and an appropriate use of that. My question is um, if that hiring takes place for FY22 and maybe even FY23, how will, when the money runs out and those needs are not needed anymore, how will that be presented in FY24 budget? Will it show up as another quote cut to services and all, even though it was entirely intended to be temporary and funded somewhere else? Or are we going to be told in FY24 that we're cutting so many hundreds of thousands of dollars um, out of our school budget again? So grant funds are not represented in terms of our ads cuts. Um, so um, I think to your, the concern I'm hearing that the district would try to, you know, uh, portray cuts that aren't actually cuts as cuts. Um, I think there's no need to be concerned about that because any anything that's funded out of grants uh, is not in an ads cuts because it's based on the, it's not coming from the appropriated budget. Thank you for that. Um, I know Councillor Shane last night asked about payroll increases in this budget and I know there's some things you can't talk about. Um, so I have a question that I'm hoping you can talk about. Um, in the FY21 budget, when COVID hit last year in FY20 and we had to readjust all of the budgets, um, did any negotiations happen or were any contractual COLA increases renegotiated between the FY20 and FY21 year um, such that the FY21 current budget has um, th that happened to account for that sudden downturn and showed up in the FY21 budget? And if that was the case, how does that affect the budget in both, how did it affect the FY21 budget, but how would it affect the proposed FY22 budget in terms of what might be shown as increases in payroll lines? I hope that's understandable. I think so. So uh, there were not any changes relative to negotiated COLAs, uh, the contract, as far as uh, that aspect of the contract, you know, we had a final year remaining and there was a negotiated COLA for that, this final year, fiscal 21, um, if memory services 1%. Um, but, uh, so there was no change there. So there would be no, uh, you know, residual sort of harm or benefit, you know, relative to, to carrying into this year's negotiations on, on that front. So I think it's a, that's a fairly straightforward, uh, circumstance. Thank you. Um, two more questions and I'll actually, I, I'll, first one's quick between FY17 and FY22 enrollment decreased 5.85% at the region. 75 total students or so. Um, in that same period, staffing levels increased 6%, a total of 18.75 positions according to the budget you have presented to us um, as of yesterday, from 311.73 staff members to 300, or FTEs, that's not necessarily staff members, um, to 330.48 FTEs. 87% of that increase came from SPED services from my reading of it and calculations of it. So my questions are, 
as enrollment is declining by 5%, more than 5%, why is staffing increasing by over 5%? Um, and then could you speak specifically to what causes nearly all of that to be within the SPED categories? Um, and for reference, uh, given the presentation last night, uh, the SPED population, at least the students with disabilities population, which is I believe where the SPED, part of the SPED increased by approximately 14 students in that period. Right, so when we talk about staffing as it relates to special education, most of the increase was paraeducators um, working with students with more intensive special needs. Um, some of that's based on students returning from out of district placements, which we think is good for the students and frankly is good for us financially. Some of that's increases in students who require paraeducators by law to receive, um, to have access to the curriculum. We happen to have a pretty large cohort a couple of years ago of students from actually all of our sending elementary schools who required an intensive paraeducator support. So if you look at our budgets back, I believe it's two years ago, uh, you'll see uh, a significant increase in paraeducators at the secondary level and a significant decrease at the elementary level uh, as things shifted between students um, and districts. And that's one of the challenges of the split district is if we were one district, it would look much more, um, it wouldn't look as dramatic, but we had a sixth grade class go to seventh grade with a lot of students who required that level of support. So I think you're right to point out that there has been an increase in, in particularly in paraeducator staff, not in professional staff um, at the secondary level. And for us that prevents students from going out of district, which uh, well, it would reduce our staffing, it would increase our costs significantly, much more significantly than increasing paraeducator staff. So, you know, I think it is an individual student need piece. We have seen an increasing number of students, uh, not just come to our schools, but also move to our district from other areas. Uh, we have to both legally and ethically accommodate those needs. And in most situations, financially, uh, as well as for the student's best interest, it's best to add staff and keep them within our district programs as opposed to sending them to out of district placements, which uh, typically um, at the secondary level in particular, uh, start in the six digit range, which is much more than the paraeducator staff that we would add. So, you know, I think it is hard to see those numbers. We see declining enrollment. We are not seeing a decline in intensive special needs students. Um, and as a result, we have had needed to add staff to accommodate for that. We've also added staff you know, on the professional side um, and things like restorative practices. We have two positions for restorative practices. Um, that wasn't in the budget five years ago. Um, so I wanna be really clear about that and, and, and transparent with you, Mandy Joe, that we have added staff based on the community uh, feedback uh, that we've received. We believe in that process. We believe that that's both beneficial for students and consistent with the educational debt we owe underserved communities. Uh, within our school population. So you're right, even in tough budget times, we have made decisions to add staff, professional staff in certain areas that were not special ed related, that were consistent with uh, what we were hearing from um, our school committee and our community. Um, so it's not all special ed related. And I think it's an important point that you made and I appreciate that. Thank you for that explanation. Um, that, that helps me understand that increase while enrollments are decreasing a lot. One last question, and it relates to the assessment method. Um, over the past few years, and I don't know, I think we're on year five, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, the regional school committee at the urging of the towns and all has been gradually moving away from the um, regional agreement method towards um, the a, a potential goal of statutory method five-year average, which isn't the full statutory method. Um, I, I'd like you to, I have a question, but more of um, in research I've been doing, isn't it true that the decision or compromise or however you wanna phrase that move from the statutory method, the regional agreement method to the state assessment method um, while trying that, that plan to move that way um, while still trying to abide by all four towns' various financial guidelines um, that are sometimes competitive with each other has actually been part of what has caused the strain on the bottom line of the budget. Because um, my calculations seem to indicate it is. Um, so, so I don't have more to add, except I emphatically agree with that. It is. Um the greatest long, term, in my opinion, I won't speak for Doug, I won't speak for the school committee, in my opinion, it's the greatest long-term risk to education we're able to provide secondary students. There are these other factors that are absolutely part of it, um, but the challenge we have year in, year out to try to negotiate a compromise, I think that's an appropriate term that you use, 
uh, that, that is a compromise between towns, not a compromise about the level of funding or the education we wanna have is a huge barrier um, to our district. And it is something that um, we go through on a yearly basis and we stop talking about students, we stop talking about needs and we start talking about percentages and 65 versus 35 versus 45. And I, I'm not complaining about that, that's part of my job, but the conversation is so different in municipal districts. Um, it's not that it's always easy, it's not that everyone always gets they, what they think is fair in terms of the uh, allotment, uh, but it is an additional variable that absolutely contributes to some of the fiscal challenges and then uh, educational challenges that we face. So I appreciate you raising that. Thank you for confirming that. <laughs> but yeah, just, just actually, to... thank you, Mandy, for bringing yeah. it up because it sort of gets into the point that I was going to try and get to it some, sometime this afternoon, which is sort of the same thing. At the four towns meeting near the beginning of the four towns meeting, I brought up the topic of needing to, to have a four town conversation that would take place outside of the normal schedule that we have that would happen earlier. So that um, the leadership of the all four towns could be in a single conversation about the budget and budget trends and how that fits in with assessment methods. And of course it got lost in what was um, a long difficult morning is we try not to recall. Um, but uh, I do think that um, we need to get back to that conversation as to whether that would be healthy because you know, what, what is happening for most of our towns is that um, as the um, state money has been stagnant and the costs have increased, the, the burden of paying for the increase has been falling on the towns continuously. And uh, that's, uh, I think, was then, gets into a lot of the tension. It plays out in the end in the tension that takes place in the assessment method discussion. There are a bunch of steps in there in between, but that seems to be what's happening. And I think instead of hiding the ball that is a four town community that cares about our regional schools, that we would be better off having a conversation about it than continuing to evade uh, and avoid the discussion. Um, so I'm uh, curious as to whether you have um, several things, whether you've given any thought to um, having that kind of process and whether that should come from the leadership on the regional school level or whether one of the towns needs to take the leadership to have that happen if it were to happen. Yeah, um, so I agree with you um, in, in, in all the principles you shared. Um, I, uh, I tend to be an optimistic person. I think those of you who know me know that about me. Uh, I am struggling to see the through line of um, how to get here where clearly there's advocacy, uh, not inquiry. I think people have done the inquiry piece for a, a number of different uh, working groups that you've been on, Andy, and I wanna thank you and others for the tremendous amount of work you put into that and Sean, uh, for how many times you facilitated meetings uh, on this topic. So um, I do think we're getting to the place at which, and I, I felt this at the four town meetings this year, getting to the place at which um, I'm a little worried about the future. Uh, of how the four towns work together. So I think past uh, the budget season, I think summer might be a logical time. Uh, out, it's like the only time that's outside the budget process for us uh, where we have a past budget and we're not yet thinking as as much about the future year's budget. I do think it'd be good to, to get together. There has been some change in leadership of some of the other member towns. Uh, some people have a lot of history, some people who have less history and there's everyone, there's gotta be seats at the table for everyone, but it's not necessarily the same people uh, who'd be there. Um, uh, you know, I, I sort of have mixed feelings, to be honest with you, about where that comes from. Um, I think when the district has, has been involved at the front end, it's, 
bluntly, we've been sort of um, positioned awkwardly by certain towns, not intentionally, not by design, uh, but um, to try to negotiate this with the communities. And that that's, I'm not sure that's the best model. Um, you know, so I do wonder if there's a different model where towns sort of separate from the regions can have that conversation and not that, you know, Allison or myself or Doug wouldn't be involved because I think you're going to need some background data and information. But um, I think that, you know, we've tried a number of times with really good people, you know, Sean, others, really good facilitators and communities who are fully invested in the process to come up with multiple alternatives. Um, you know, and I do wonder if it's at a time where the district actually is, is fulfilling its role to provide data requests and to be partners in the work, but the towns say, you know, we've got a problem here uh, and we need to work on it. It's not so much about the regional district trying to facilitate us. We need to come together and figure out what direction we want to go in in the future because the year by year piece is really hard. Uh, you all experienced that the last two years. I think one of your first meetings as a new council was the Fort Town meeting, which was an unfortunate, uh, uh, fortu a fortu unfortunate timing, I think, today at least. If you want to think about some of the more arcane conversations we have, it's about regional assessment methods, and you all were, were pushed to jump right in. Um, so long-winded answer, Andy. I'm open to anything. I, I don't want to speak for Allison, but I think she'd be happy to participate. Doug, I know, would be happy to participate. Um, but I, I do wonder if it would feel a little different if it wasn't uh, the perception of the region trying to uh, gather people and wrangle them into moving forward as a region, but really the, the towns recognizing that this is an ongoing longitudinal issue that needs the towns need to come up and, and try to help solve. We're happy to be partners in that work, but um, you know what we don't want to get accused of, which invariably happens, is siding with one town or another. We're, we're sort of neutral arbiters in this one. And I, and I appreciate the, you need to be the neutral arbiter. Um, you also are a very important participant because you're the one who's providing the education and running the uh, school system. And uh, the uh, process that we've had in the past that Sean was uh, involved with that you were referring to, um, was really focusing on the assessment method. We never really touched on the budget or, or right. the connection between the assessment method and the budget during those conversations because it always started out with what we knew, what we knew the budget was going to be for the year, and then how we were going to deal with the assessment method for the next year, pretty much. Um, and I, so we've missed the ability to um, really focus on where that linkage is between the two and how the assessment method um, and the pressures in the towns flow through to affect the schools and how we need to make decisions on what we can afford in schools. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough topic and I appreciate your uh, uh, giving some thought to that. Doug, do we know when the, um, uh, town meetings are for the three towns this year? Have they set dates? Uh, they have. Um, so, uh, and now of course, do I remember them? Uh, uh, I believe Pelham's May 8th, uh, Leverett is May 1st, and Shootsbury is June 12th. Shootsbury's going pretty late. Yeah, they, they, uh, they moved it from their normal time in late April, early May. Um, I think it was COVID related, hoping for vaccinations to be done at that point. So they were able to be a little more flexible if they did it later. Okay, now that, that's helpful because we obviously, one of the things that you were referring to a few minutes ago was how we got to the cycle we're in now with uh, this discussion happening today as opposed to several weeks away and it, to tie into town meetings. And so knowing the town meetings are uh, was a part of it. Um, I know that there are a couple of other people in the attendee group. Uh, I think one is a council and one is not. So I'm gonna ask again, whether um, if either wants to um, be recognized and um, brought in, then uh, please raise your hand so that I know and can manage the rest of this meeting. So uh, either the counselor or the non-counselor, if you 
want to um, join the meeting and ask questions or make comments, please raise your hand so that I know. And uh, while I'm hope looking for that, I'm going to pause and go back to other members of the committee. And I know that Lynn has her hand up. So Lynn. So um, I want to go back to this regional discussion. And besides urging that we have a, a, a budget discussion in the summer, not a formula discussion, uh, would be good. But I want to go to the more immediate question now that we know the times of the town meetings. Um, we, as, we as a committee need to decide when we're going to complete our work and when you want to bring this to the council. And let me just point out that there is a council meeting on May 3rd, not again to the 15th. I think I'm right on that. I'll check. Um, so we need to decide. And I think some of that <clears throat> is um, related to a nuance of what signal do we want to send? I think it's a reasonable question. Okay, so our, our meetings in May are the um, the 3rd, the 17th, and the 24th. Um, we should probably have that discussion at the next committee meeting um, in more detail, but my, my thinking right now would be to recommend to the committee to go ahead and do it early on May 3rd. Uh, it might be helpful for the other towns if we are going to support the entire recommendation, including the um, assessment method that we that other towns know that that's where we are. That that's my thinking, but I wanted to you know tap into yeah. the political thinking that you have brought to the table and to you know the superintendent. <laughs> Doug. Well, I, I certainly uh, would welcome any comments that might be offered by Superintendent Morris or Dr. Slaughter, but um, I don't expect them to necessarily offer an opinion on the subject because, uh, as noted, they need to be neutral to all four towns. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions about the budget from either attendees or panelists that uh, we want to bring up at this point? Because if not, uh, then uh, certainly we could let our uh, guests go in with great appreciation. Dorothy, no, I'm sorry, Dorothy, you did have your hand up. Uh, I just wanted to pick up a conversation we had last night about cuts to the arts program and to ask a smaller group if there are thoughts that you have of being able to restore those cuts in any way as things move forward. Uh, maybe my last uh, unsatisfying answer that I'll give to the council on the regional budget. Um, that's really, you know, not at this funding level, just to be blunt about it, right? So if the funding level changes, absolutely, we could, we could, have that conversation, uh, but at the funding level that we have, and that's not a complaint. That's just you know answering your question directly. Um, you know, it it seems to us like it's a prudent uh, reduction to make. Uh, if there was no budget uh, pressures, would we want more arts for our kids? And all the ways that you said last night, absolutely. Um, but you know, it's not where we are at the moment. And if that changes, we'll we'll get back to you. Maybe I should ask one additional question. Um, I had started my comment earlier about the difficulty with the budget um, being presented as uh, level services and then cuts and additions and then causing these very large number of cuts, which is a public relations problem for the towns that make us look like we're squeezing the schools uh, which isn't where we start from by any means. And uh, is this a traditional method that's used across the board? Or does it relate in any way to DESI expectations or is it really our district and its history? Did 
is not as hard. Yield a better answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, do you want me to take a crack at it, Doug? Sure, please. So, um, you know, a lot of it is for the school committee. Um, you know, the school committee wants to know what it would cost to provide the same level of programming next year as it is this year. And then the reason why all the additions and reductions are in one spot is because we want it to be very easy to see what changes there are to that level services budget from the prior year. Um, and then what happens is after the school committee votes it and the budget is voted, then that single line item in the budget gets allocated up above to the actual accounts. Um, so this, the starting point for the next year's budget would have all those ads and cuts allocated up above. Um, but I, I think the process that the region, you know, assuming it's still using the same process of rolling everything forward, um, my understanding is that's pretty standard among school districts is that you project the level, in, unless the town says, no, we don't want to see level services, we want to see something different. Um, but most, I think, school committees want to see what a level services would cost. Um, and that level services can include the enrollment adjustments um, that, that Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter have, have spoken about, um, which is why those are shown a little bit differently, those enrollment adjustments. I think I could add to that. I think the additional challenge, and I think you it was implied in your comment, Andy, is that you know, for a town of Amherst, and I'm not trying to fuel flames that exist, whether or whatever I say is for the town of Amherst, there's a 2.1% increase in this budget, but for the assessments in general, it's below that. So I think that's where regional budgets get particularly complicated explaining to the public, because for the town of Amherst, you know, the elementary schools, all the other departments. Are pretty constant, but the the two point one percent increase from the town of Amherst nets a one point five overall increase in assessments, which is really different from the other departments. And so I think that's when I was making my comments before, and um, for Councillor Haneke's comments, that's where it gets um, both confusing and explaining that to the public, um, and also really unsatisfying in explaining to the public that you know that it's a it's a relative for whatever formula is used, it's relational. It you know it's not that. All the, all the towns go up the same amount each year. So, you know, for people to look at some of them, you could look at Pelham and say, oh my God, how, is the, how are you making budget cuts when Pelham's contributing over 4% more? And then you could look at some of the other towns that are having, they're paying less next year than what they paid this year. And, and that's a really hard public relations uh, communication challenge that we have. Um, and, you know, any support we have or any ideas that has to be at this moment about how to accurately share that with the public. Um, it gets very, very complicated. And I think you're right that it, it, it tends to uh, have the perception that the towns, or in your case, the town of Amherst is not supporting education or the regional schools in the same way you're other, supporting other departments. And the data is that you are exactly the same percentage as other departments, but the net because there's other towns involved in a relational formula doesn't really yield the same benefits. Um, and, and that's a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing for you all. I have a lot of empathy for you uh, in, in managing uh, comments to that effect. Uh, and it's a hard thing as me. And that's what I was really responding to. I thought uh, Councillor Haneke's uh, very precise uh, concern that she was expressing that I agreed with. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, what I'm going to do one last round of requests to either panelists, uh, members of the Finance Committee. Um, or attendees, if anybody has any further comments or questions, because if not, uh, we really appreciate uh, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter for having spent time with us this afternoon. And uh, we need to bring it to a close. So that's why I'm making this one last um, offer to panelists and uh, attendees to see if anybody uh, wants to raise hand. I do see one hand. Um, if there's no objection, to, uh, uh, Superintendent, uh, I'll bring, um, ask the Athena bring Mandy back in to Mandy. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, given what Superintendent Morris just said, I actually just have a question or a clarification because I, I I know he knows I have struggled with um you know some of the facts in terms of the last five years of what the budget is versus um how how much the budget has gone up how much the assessment has gone up and how much Amherst's assessment has gone up um versus how much Pelham Leverett and Shutesbury's assessments have actually gone down um and so I guess one of the questions I have is is, is there 
and, and this isn't necessarily for this year. Um, so, but but are there assessments? Are, are there is there an ability to do an assessment method that doesn't relate to anything percentage wise? You know, we we have assessment agreements that are per student per this, but is there a possibility of doing assessment methods which is essentially you couldn't figure out a formula? You could just say Amherst assessment is X Y Z. Pelham's is X, Y, Z, Shootsbury's is X, Y, Z, and Leverett's is X, Y, Z, and none of them, there's no formula that gets there. That's just a flat number. Um, yeah. Oh, my sense is Desi doesn't like that. They like a formula. Um, Mr. Mangano has had more conversations than most with the people at Desi uh, in charge of regional budgets. Um, and if you had anything, you don't have to, Sean, I don't want to put you on the spot yet again, but if you want to add anything, but in general, they, they tend to like things that are relational um, more than things that are, we think this is fair. You know, Sean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you, you. so they do give you pretty wide latitude in what you have as a formula. Um, we've studied a lot of different things. Um, you know, I'd say probably over 30 or 40 different methods or variations of different methods. Um, but I agree with Mike, I do think you need something in the regional agreement. That's one of the, the pieces I believe that's required in the regional agreement. And um, I don't think it could be just like, we're gonna come up with the amounts each year. I think it has to be something independent of that. Um, and then they and they sort of want you to stick with something. That's one of the issues that Mike has been speaking to. We've been doing this a, a lot. Um, and at the end of my time there, I was starting to get the sense from Desi that they were a little annoyed with us modifying the method every single year and without us knowing exactly where we were going. Um, I think they're they're flexible, but they wanna they they want stability just like we want stability. Um, so I do think to Mike's point, it's important that we um that the region figure something out soon about where it's going that it can stick with for a while. Thank you. Yeah, I, I should add, um, the assessment method, um, even when you're using the um, statutory method, a part of it goes back to the regional agreement method, which is the five-year rolling average of enrollment. So that even though we say that we're moving towards a statutory method, there's a piece of the statutory method that fall, goes back to the regional agreement and uses the regional agreement. Uh, Sean can explain this a lot better than I can, quite frankly, but um, uh, the, uh, one of the things that came up at last night's meeting, and it might've been maybe your question in part, as to when we're gonna finally get to amending the regional agreement to um, address the changes in our form of government and make them appear in an appropriate way in the regional agreement. And I think that one of the things about um, amending the regional agreement is once you open the process for one purpose, you may end up creating a four town discussion about wanting to open the um, regional agreement to talk about a number of different issues. And uh, so there's, um, it's a very politically difficult and delicate topic to get into the discussion of changing the regional agreement. Uh, so the, I think think that we um, may need to just continue to be patient on the subject. Anything else Looking to the entire group? So Superintendent Morris, Dr. Slaughter, thank you very much. We really appreciated it. I think that for us, it was a very helpful conversation. So thank you. And thank, thank you for having time. us. Yeah, and thanks for all the questions. They're they're really helpful, and they they make us better in terms of thinking about what questions you know that you have that you're hearing from you know your constituents and how we can improve our process around budgeting. So we really appreciate uh, last night and this and this afternoon. We also know that your meeting didn't end. Uh, I heard that your meeting didn't end when we left last night. So I know you're working on uh, extra time, uh, and so we really appreciate your support and. Uh, comments, questions, and critiques as we move forward. Uh, it's all very appreciated. Appreciate your your service. Kathy, do you have a final comment? You're muted. Oh, you're muted, though. 
in saying farewell to you, when you come back with the elementary school budget, I'm also going to be asking about enrollment trends and FTEs. So if that's already in it, great. But if you have to add a table, you know, just to understand what lies underneath our, our school system. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I don't think that we need to do too much more today, though we should spend a couple of minutes talking about um, scheduling for ourselves. And um, Sean, I, uh, one is when to take up the uh, regional school issue again and try and push that to get it back to the council. And the other is, um, didn't we leave the um, question of uh, getting to the open back to the OPEB discussion, hanging, and I'm trying to think of what other issues we have hanging. Uh, water sewer was the other one. Yeah, Andy, do you want, can I share the calendar, the latest calendar real quick, and then sure. talk about when those things might come up, and that way I can update it too if we make any changes. Do you all see the um, the calendar? Yes, I okay. can make it a little wider. Yeah, right? let me make it bigger. Yeah, please, please enlarge it. Is that still small? No, that's fine for me. Just... Okay. So um, the last change we made was to move the town, the discussion of the water and sewer rates um, at the town council level before it gets referred to the 12th. Um, we did have a finance committee meeting on here for the 20th. I don't know if that's going to continue, but um, that's the one where theoretically we would have a space to add the um, OPEB report if we're going to keep that meeting. Are you, uh, Sean, that's school vacation week. I'm just pointing out for you and your family. I don't know if that's. Yeah, we can't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing it up, Lynn. <laughs> um, I, but, but you're right. If any, other people have conflicts, I, I don't, um, I'm available, but it's up to the committee if you guys want to meet. I would just assume we go ahead and meet and that we make the recommendation that day because then it would be in the packet uh, before May 1st, which is Leverett's town meeting. And so it would, it would do what I'm trying to do or suggesting we do, and that's send the signal. Okay. And do you, should we add the OPEB? I can see if the actuary is available that day. Yeah, I think you could add the OPEB. Peb, um, and then you are going to have water and sewer rates by then too. Yeah, we've got those scheduled for the fourth. Um, I mean, we okay. could always move them up if we want to, but we've got that on the agenda for the fourth. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. That's fine. I think if we just do OPEB and the regional budget, we're fine. And we also tentatively had um, a JCPC report update. Um, again, I don't, you know, I was look, thinking about it this year and I'm not sure whether we need to do an update for the JCPC report at the finance committee level because finance committee is going to review the actual capital improvement program. Um, so it'd be a little bit sort of, it might get confusing to review one thing and then see something a little bit different, but um, we can certainly give highlights of the, the JCPC process if the committee wants it. Um, it's going to, it's a, it's a community that recommends to the town manager. Yeah. It's clear that the finance committee has much to do with it. Okay. I mean, we have a lot to do with it when it comes back in the town manager's budget. Right. So it's in the right place coming after May 1st. Yep. Kathy was, I think, getting ready to raise her hand. Uh, I, I just had a question on the water and sewer. Um, when Guilford comes, when he does the presentation to the council, and then when he comes to us, um, my understanding is the centennial costs ended up being higher than what we last saw. So um, if that's in fact confirmed, could we be seeing now, not just next year's water and sewer rates, but a trajectory out um, once those capital costs, and it may be that it won't have any impact on water, the rates because, he can, more can be absorbed out of the reserve. So I just, it's a request, not a change the schedule. 
Yeah, we're, you'll definitely see that. Um, the only thing I don't, I just, we haven't sort of uh, finalized yet whether that'll be part of the water sewer rate, the out years, or if, if that'll be part of the enterprise fund discussion, but it'll definitely be part of one of those. Um, but if there's a strong preference that it's part of the, the water sewer rate, I'm sure we can. I just, I, I know guess, they're related, so it's always a little, sometimes so a discussion. I'm just wondering whether other had the feeling that at the point we're doing a public presentation on them to show just one year when we know they're going up in subsequent years and it's not the same as people saw last time, it feels to me like it's better to be showing that mm -hmm. and not wait till we then see it later in the enterprise funds. Just it's like a, it's a forewarning. Um, sure. That may be just me, but I, I like a, a fuller picture the first time it comes up, then, oh, um, I'm not going to tell you about two years from now or a year yeah, and a no, half. I can work. I can connect with Guilford and, um, and the town manager on that. Okay. And, and just Sean, you know, we had this, we have a standing request um, to meet Bernie and I just quickly on, we're not changing anything. I understand that, but just to talk about, should we ever want to change the way we do the water rates? What might it look like? So, he could come back and have that discussion with finance in the summer, in the fall, but just get some ideas of, of what he might come back to show. It would be good to, I know he's been very busy doing a lot of other things, so. Yeah, we can try to get that meeting scheduled um, maybe this week, That I mean, get it scheduled this week um, so that we've got it on the calendar. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of it, uh, so you see Bernie's hand is up too, and I know he's been uh, working on the issue too, is I want to bring Bernie, uh, I recognize Bernie in just a second, but um, there has to be a decision made in on the 12th of April when this is a hearing before the council and the presentation made as a part of the hearing as to whether it is totally focusing on next year's rates or whether it's going to have that long-term uh, element to it that Kathy was describing. So it's another thing that's sort of hanging out there because um, there may be questions that come up about it regardless of whether you choose to bring it up or not. Bernie? I just wanted to reinforce what uh, Kathy's point about bringing in a, the discussion on the centennial as part of the budget process and looking at what that impact that might have um, three to two, two to five years out. I think it's important for the public to know that. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of chatter and some of it is likely wrong. And if we get that information out to early and not put it in as part of a uh, enterprise, it, it's probably the enterprise fund discussion, but having it talked in the water and sewer budget um, gives that, it gets as information out there and gives people some assurances about what's going on. Okay, Lynn? I also think that with it, it would be useful for um, Guilford to give us an update on the cost of Centennial uh, because my understanding is he um, is looking at how to bring the cost back down again. And it would be useful to know that and to understand the drivers on it because part of that issue is one that kept driving the concern about the library and any other capital projects, whether or not your estimates are solid. But in this case, um, my understanding is he was asked to see if he could figure out how to reduce it. Anything else with the other members of the committee about questions about the calendar as of now? Dorothy? Unmute. Okay, yeah. Um, any chance of federal infrastructure money going to Centennial? I think they're looking into that. Um, so I think the answer is yes. They're, um, that's something they're considering. In addition to state money. Yeah, we haven't um, we haven't gotten the um, 
again, the specific rules on the stimulus funds yet, the American Rescue Plan um, on the, the town funds. I know the school funds came up earlier, um, and I'm sure that'll be a topic that we'll include at a future finance committee meeting. Um, we have the general buckets, sort of, again, the same thing that school said, uh, but we haven't got the specific rules and regulations from the treasury yet that says what you can and cannot do with it um, with, with the actual detail we need to implement it. So, um, so yeah, once we have that information, that'll give us a lot more direction about what those funds can go uh, be used for. Okay. Anything else? Any, other, any business not anticipated 48 hours in advance? Seeing none, I think that uh, we can adjourn. So um, I thank you all for, um, I think it was a very productive meeting. And uh, at 10 minutes before four, um, I'll consider us adjourned. Thanks, Sam. Bye, everyone. Bye.